subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go hello and welcome to today's dns session we are going to have a discussion on today's newspaper the hindu delhi edition dated 20th june 2021 we shall pick up articles which are important for civil service examination and we shall discuss them as per the demand of the exam the articles that we have picked up for today's discussion are there on your screen and the time stamping for the same has been given in the description section there is an article on the science and tech page of today's newspaper delta plus and an emerging public health threat scientists all over the world they are concerned about this variant of novel coronavirus delta plus there has been studies all around the world including india that shows that this particular variant can escape antibodies and if it can escape antibodies you know what will happen antibodies are only weapon against the virus but it doesn't mean that it will escape any antibodies it will escape the antibodies that have been in the body so far as a reaction to coronavirus infection which means that the person can get reinfected by this particular variant but it is not just the question of reinfection there is also a big question of infectivity that means how easily it can get transferred into the community and severity of the disease before discussing further delta plus variant we'll just go through basics first of all mutation is a change in the genetic material in the genetic sequence of any organism sars cov2 that is causing the covid-19 pandemic is an rna based virus mutation in case of sars cov2 means that there has been changes in the sequence of rna and because this virus is rna based virus it is prone to mutation mutation in an rna virus often happens when the virus makes a mistake in the process of reproduction in the process of multiplication inside the host cell and mistakes are bound to happen in the process of production of virus inside the host cell because virus is using the reproduction machinery of the host cell it doesn't have one of its own so the reproduction mechanism is not very advanced sophisticated in human body there are dna sequence correcting enzymes if in the multiplication of dna there are some mistakes that is identified and corrected but that mechanism for the case of virus does not exist and more so it is not just rna based virus it is single strand rna based virus and in single strand rna based virus there are more chances of mistake because there is no pairing happening as happens in the case of double strand rna so mutation is a result of mistake and mistakes will happen and hence we have many strains of virus that you must be keeping up with from current affairs who has established a simple system of nomenclature for naming and tracking various variants of sars cov2 the variants are classified into families named by the greek letters like alpha beta gamma and now we also have delta variant among the variants of coronavirus there is a category called as variants of concern who classifies a sars cov2 variant as a variant of concern if it shows one or more of these characteristics if the virus has higher transmissibility it is spreading faster at epidemiological level meaning it has higher infectivity or there is a higher virulence there is a higher severity of disease or there is a decrease in effectiveness of public health and social measures these are the three broad areas of concern regarding virus and if the virus shows a changed behavior changed characteristic concerning these three areas or more than one of these areas then the virus is classified as variants of concern so far we have four families of virus as variant of concern beginning from alpha we have went to beta gamma and now delta variant different platforms were giving different names to them who has unified it and started naming it as per the greek alphabets delta variant alternatively is also very popular with this name b.1.617.1 and a new variant within the delta variant family is b.1.617.2.1 there's a category of virus called as variants of interest these are not variants of concern meaning they have not increased infectivity or severity or they have not altered the efficacy of public health and social measures but they have been identified in large number in community transmission 
For example, the Delta variant presently is estimated to be 21% of the total viral infection in India. So it is a variant of interest presently, Delta plus variant. If the variants of interest starts to show the characteristics that we have seen here, then it will be called as variants of concern. Variants of concerns can also be seen as viruses, their strains that pose substantial threat to humanity. As we have talked about, WHO is naming the variants, their family, according to Greek alphabet, beginning from alpha, beta, gamma, we have reached till delta in variants of concern. Then the letters coming after gamma, they are used to name variants of interest. After gamma, we have epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, iota, kappa, lambda. These are variants of interest and many suggest that by the end of the year, the Greek alphabets are going to be exhausted. The Delta Plus variant, popularly also called as AY.1, is a family of Delta variant. Delta Plus variant is of particular concern because it has a mutation called as K417N. This mutation although has been found previously in beta variant which was first found in South Africa and the gamma variant which was found in Brazil. But the delta variant apart from having K417N mutation also has N501Y mutation. And many studies suggest these are preliminary studies and WHO has not declared delta plus variant as a variant of concern. It is only a variant of interest but there are studies which shows that these two mutations they fully abolish the antibody effect. These two mutations are also related to spike protein. And you know it is a spike protein that gets latched up with the ACE2 protein on the cell membrane of the host cell. And from here, the story of viral infection begins. These mutations in the spike protein are making the virus highly infectious. And there's a serious concern that it may reduce the potency efficacy of vaccines. In India, the latest data is of till May and around 31% of 21,000 community samples that have been collected is Delta variant. Because of mutation, the survival chances of virus becomes differentiated inside the host and eventually few variants starts dominating in an area. Delta variant gradually is increasing its dominance in the region of India and around. And because the mutation is in the spike protein and you understand that most of the pharma companies they have used the antigen of a spike protein to make the vaccine. If there is an alteration in the spike protein then there is a fear that these vaccines will be rendered either less useful or useless. Theoretical studies already have come from countries like UK, South Africa and Brazil which suggest that fewer antibodies are produced when the infection has come from the Delta variant. Even the Indian laboratories like the one of ICMR and CSIR, they have reported that vaccines like Covishield and Covaxin, they produce fewer antibodies, fewer than those produced against the strain used by companies to make their vaccines. And the strain of Delta variant or Delta plus was not used. And if there is significant difference in the strain, especially in the spike protein, then there is going to be problem. Generally what happens, mutation keeps on happening, but all mutation does not result in substantial change in the behavior of virus. Every mutation will not increase its infectivity or severity. So vaccines are developed on the assumption that mutation will not happen in particular area or even when mutation happens, a larger sequence of antigen is used so that some part of even the mutated virus is recognized by the antibody. But if the mutation is so substantial that there is significant change in the protein structure, then of course the vaccine developed using the previous strain will not work. And if fewer antibodies are being produced, it also means that new drug treatments that have been approved recently, for example monoclonal antibody treatment, will also be rendered less effective. In monoclonal antibody treatment what happens, you create one kind of antibody concerning one kind of variant. When the infection happens to any person, it takes some time for the antibodies to be produced. It may take 7 to 29 days, even more than that. Even when we give vaccine to a person, even then, the body takes time to produce antibody against the antigen used in the vaccine. But if the condition of the patient is too severe and he cannot afford to remain ill for that amount of time, he is severely critically ill. 
then in that case you have to give antibodies immediately. So there's a method to produce antibody at a very rapid pace in lab actually. We take the beta cells, the kind of WBC that produce antibody, we merge it with myoloma cell. Myoloma cell are cancerous cells and cancerous cells you know multiply very fast, very fast. They can survive outside the body as well. Cancerous cell or myeloma cell, they can survive even outside the body. If you keep it in the lab, keep giving nutrition to the cell, it will keep multiplying and will survive years and years outside the body. When we merge the myeloma cell with the WBC cell producing the antibody, the beta cells, hybridoma cell. This hybridoma cell will have two characteristics. It will have characteristics of myeloma cell that will multiply very fast. It will also have the characteristics of WBC cell that you have taken. That means it will also produce antibodies and it will keep multiplying like hell. That means you have multiple sources of antibodies creation because you have multiple hybridoma cells. The multiplication of the cell is through the process of mitosis. So there are identical daughter cells being produced and hence the name monoclonal. The same kind of clone are being produced multiple times and multiple antibodies will be produced. When that is injected into the body, action against the virus starts to happen immediately. But this antibody will be produced based upon the memory of the B cells, based upon the antigen it has encountered before. But now you have a new antigen because the spike protein has completely changed. So these antibodies again is not going to work. And if nothing is going to work, you are going to fall sick again. Just like falling sick from a new virus. And that will create a new challenge of management of epidemic. If the expansion of Delta variant and the Delta plus variant happens, then the preparation of vaccine that we have done so far may be rendered less useful. And because of that, another wave of COVID-19 may come. But at this stage, it is just speculation. Nothing has been declared by WHO in this regard. And this variant is still variant of interest, not variant of concern. This article is from page number one. This article is volunteers from 33 panchayats of a block in Rajasthan have planted 5100 saplings as part of Harit Marubhumi or the green desert drive going on in the part of Rajasthan. Women of this block earlier have pledged to consider plants as green members of their family and hence the headline they have vowed to nurture green family. This plantation drive was carried out as part of celebration of World Day to Combat Desertification. You can look at this article from various perspectives. You can have a perspective on this from point of view of GS Paper 1. In GS Paper 1, you have a section of society. In the section of society, there's a topic called as Role of Women and Women's Organization. When you do Women's Organization and Role of Women in Society, you do all kind of organization including environmental organizations and the effect of that and the manner and the way in which role of women in society is changed the way it gives leadership position to women the way it enhances the social stature of women the way it empowers them socially in 2015 there was a question in mains examination of gs paper one how do you explain the statistics that shows that the sex ratio in tribes in India is more favorable to women than the sex ratio among scheduled castes. Although there are various reasons like technological access, etc, etc. But one of the prominent reasons for this is the gender role of women defined in tribal community. The importance to a gender in society is given according to the role played by the gender in the society. In the tribal culture, there are prominent important roles played by women. For example, plucking flowers, role related to the textiles, or some other intricate and knowledgeable works like making some tribal herbal medicines. In other community or in scheduled castes, such roles are not very well defined or may not even exist. Most of the economical work is related with masculinity. So more importance is given to male genders and hence they are not killed when they are born. Females are. So the sex ratio are not in the favor of women. The point is when you carry out afforestation drive, when you carry out any environmental activity, the role of women invariably is more in such activity and such roles empower women socially. 
There is also a topic of poverty and developmental issues in the society paper. Land degradation is one cause of poverty. Land degradation also increases burden on women to carry out extra activities. Going to the far fest area to collect the fuel wood. Land degradation also causes water scarcity that also adds again more burden on women to go to the far fest areas to bring water. You can look at the issue of afforestation from the perspective of GS paper 3 as well. In the section of environment, you have topic mentioned as conservation environmental pollution and degradation, environmental impact assessment. This conservation is a broad topic that includes environmental conservation in general and forest conservation in particular. So it will include afforestation drive. Afforestation is a broad topic that you have to cover and within that, combating desertification is a subtopic. The context of the news is celebration of World Day to combat desertification. And that comes out of United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. This convention, although was opened up for signing in 1994, it came into effect in 1996 after 50 parties to the convention ratified it. But it is one of the three Rio Convention, the other two being Convention on Biological Diversity and United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. UNCCD is considered to be the sole legally binding international agreement and India is party to it. It is legally binding international agreement on linking environment and development to sustainable land management. Although we have several other international initiatives like bond challenge to increase the area under forest, but this is the sole legally binding international agreement on land management. Like other conventions, this convention also obliges the national government to take measures to fulfill the target and the aim and the vision and the goal of the convention. Environmental movements and environmental conventions, they have always recognized bottom-up approach. United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification has come up with a 2018 to 2030 strategic framework. One of the important aim of this strategic framework is to achieve land degradation neutrality. This is an important term for your prelims examination. The parties to the convention define land degradation neutrality as a state whereby the amount and quality of land resources necessary to support ecosystem functions and services and to enhance food security remains stable. So much of land resources remain stable or increases within specified temporal and spatial scales and ecosystems. So either it remains stable or it increases. How much of land? So much of land which is necessary to support ecosystem functions and services and so much of land required to enhance food security. In 2016 prelims examination, UPSC has asked this question. Which is our importance of United Nations Convention to combat desertification? First statement was, it aims to promote effective action through innovative national programs and supportive international partnerships. Of course, any convention does it. Any convention encourages the national government to adopt innovative measures to meet the goal of the convention. So this is a very benign, true sounding statement. It has a special or a particular focus on South Asia and North Africa regions and its secretariat facilitates the allocation of major portion of financial resources to these regions. See, although land degradation is a problem related with developing countries and vulnerability to land degradation is also more in developing countries. Most of the developing countries are in Southern Hemisphere. So the Secretariat of UNCCD do facilitates South-South cooperation, but there is no provision as such separate for South Asia and separate for North Africa region. This was a very bold attempt on the part of UPSC to give an incorrect statement. Factually, this is incorrect. Third statement talks about bottom-up approach, which also sounds very benign and true kind of statement. Answer was option C. You can look at this topic also from the perspective of GS Paper 4. In GS Paper 4 syllabus, the first topic is ethics and human interface. In that, you have to study the essence, determinant and consequence of ethics in human actions. Then you have to study dimensions of ethics. When you do dimensions of ethics, 
you do environmental ethics. So this afforestation drive at the grassroots led by women is a good example of environmental ethics which you can incorporate in your answers. There is an article on page number 7, Jammu and Kashmir delimitation panel begins work. See delimitation literally means to define boundaries, to set the limits of any area. In this particular context, it means setting the limits defining the boundaries of a territorial constituent, the constituencies for either assembly election or the general election. Delimitation is done in response to the changing demography of an area. The prime objective is to provide equal representation to equal population segment so that the concept of one vote, one value can be implemented effectively. But additionally, there are other purpose of delimitation as well. For example, having fair division of geographical areas so that one political party does not have an advantage over others in the election. So when the delimitation commission carve out the territorial constituencies, it is kept in mind that these should not be framed based on presence of a dominant political party in one area. The concept of delimitation emanates from the constitution itself. Article 82 and Article 170 of our constitution provides for readjustment and division of each state into territorial constituents. How? In a manner given by parliament by law. Under Article 82, the parliament enacts a delimitation act after every census. And under Article 172, the states can also go ahead and divide their territorial constituencies as per the Delimitation Act enacted by the Parliament. So first the census happens, then the Act comes into force and then the Delimitation Commission is set up by the Union Government. So Delimitation Commission as such would be considered as a constitutional body or a statutory body. Tell me. The commission is appointed by the president and it works in close coordination with Election Commission of India. In fact, the composition of the commission is such that it is headed by a retired Supreme Court judge. And the chief election commissioner and respective state election commissioners, they are the members of the commission. Delimitation commission is a very powerful body. The commission's final order, the final framework, the final arrangement of delimited constituencies, the final boundaries formed by it, cannot be challenged in a court of law. The order of the commission is laid before Lok Sabha and the respective state assemblies, but there also modifications are not allowed. So the order of delimitation commission is final. Delimitation commission has been formed so far four times in 1952, 62, 72 and 2002. After that, the delimitation of constituencies have been frozen. But the last delimitation that did not happen in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, the erstwhile state, the delimitation process throughout India was carried out between 2002 and 2008. But the assembly constituencies of the state was under Jammu and Kashmir constitution. And they had separate representation of People Act. But now when it has been converted into a union territory, a delimitation commission has been set up. Remember, delimitation exercise is to not change the number of seats in any state. Because via 84th constitutional amendment, we have frozen the delimitation of Lok Sabha and state assembly constituencies till the first census after 2026. So the last delimitation did not change the number of seats in any state because it happened in the span of 2002-2008 and this amendment already came in 2002. The Delimitation Commission only redrew the boundaries and they worked out the number of reserved seats for SCSTs. They look into as to the area that is more populated, dominantly populated by scheduled caste and scheduled tribe and they decide upon the seats that are to be reserved for SCST category. But because of the exceptional situation of Jammu and Kashmir, this time, the delimitation commission for the state that has been formed, it will also work out the increase in the number of assembly seats from 107 to 114. And it is expected that the representation from the Jammu region will increase. UPSC has asked a question in 2012 on delimitation commission. With reference to the delimitation commission, consider the following statements. 
the orders of the delimitation commission cannot be challenged in a court of law when the order of the delimitation commission are laid before lok sabha or its state assembly they cannot effect any modification in the orders told you it's a powerful body the answer would be option c there is an article on page number 5 related to mekedatu dam project of the state of karnataka mekedatu this is a region where there is deep gorge at the confluence of river kaveri and its tributary akravathi this is almost at the border of the state of karnataka and tamil nadu Mekedadu project is fairly important for the state of Karnataka and the stated purpose is to store and supply water for drinking purpose for Bangalore. A 400 megawatt of power is also proposed to be generated from the project. But it is important to know that the state of Karnataka does not have a stated plan of diverting the water of river Kaveri meaning canals will not be built for agriculture purpose or otherwise. The power project does not consume water rather they just consume the energy of flowing water. The project has received approval from the erstwhile Ministry of Water Resources now called as Ministry of Jal Shakti. But this project is still awaiting approval from Ministry of Environment Forest and Climate Change. The approval from Ministry of Environment Forest and Climate Change is essential in this case because the planned project will submerge 63% of forest area of kaveri wildlife sanctuary the clearance of the project is still in the pipeline from concerned regulatory bodies it has not got all the clearances the state of tamil nadu being a lower riparian state for river kaveri of course will have anxieties related to the project it will have its concern and those concern have been aired by the state time and again in 2018 the state approached supreme court against the project even if Karnataka has held that the water would not be diverted so the flow of water to Tamil Nadu will not get affected the matter also went to the Kaveri Water Management Authority which is set up by union government but again the project was not stayed by the authority the contention of Tamil Nadu is because supreme court was involved in awarding the water usage right for river Kaveri so no project must be taken up without the approval of supreme court on river Kaveri Tamil Nadu is pointing to the fact that in the final order of Kaveri Water Dispute Tribunal Supreme Court has held that no state can claim exclusive ownership or asset rights to deprive other states of the waters of interstate rivers but then it's a gray area the state of Karnataka is not saying that it is diverting water water used for drinking purpose will only be a small percentage and there is no plan for constructing any canals for agriculture or industrial purpose This must also be seen in the context of water crisis in the city of Bangalore. But the contention of Tamil Nadu is that the reservoir that Karnataka will build will not just be used for drinking water alone, but to increase the extent of irrigation, and that will clearly violate the Kaveri Water Dispute Award. The matter is still not closed. The concerned regulatory bodies are yet to give clearance to the project, but the project has not been stayed by any regulatory body. either the ministry of jal shakti or the ministry of environment or kaveri water management authority the call on this will be taken first by ngt once other regulatory bodies give the clearance the matter will be cleared by ngt first if the states get satisfied well and good otherwise the matter is likely to go to supreme court now come we have end to the session today's question of the day and answer to yesterday's question are there on your screen Please attempt the question post your answer and also please attempt the DNS quiz on the Elan platform that will give you a sense of completion of current affair from today goodbye take care